Section 20 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5b, Subsection A. Pleasure and Necessity. Translator's Note. The succeeding three sections discuss the procedure of one-sided subjective individualism, the attempt to realize the individual and yet not transcend the particular individuality. The first thought of self-consciousness, when it seeks to realize or objectify itself as a mere individual, is to make the objective element return directly to itself and bring a sense of increase of its own individual being or private pleasure. This is all its interest in the practical realization of its purposes. But the realization of purposes is an expression of the life of reason, and reason means universality and systematic connection of the content realized. Hence to seek solely private satisfaction or pleasure by a process which is inherently universal is a contradiction in terms. This contradiction the individual discovers in the shape of a sharp and painful contrast between its private feeling of individuation on the one hand and the network of universal connections on the other. The contrast between pleasure and necessity both fall within the individual's experience as a rational agent and hence this necessity is his own necessity as much as the pleasure is his own pleasure in the opposition between these factors there is no question as to which must triumph and which must surrender this is the type of experience analyzed in the following section it is an experience that constantly recurs in the life history of most if not all human beings at one stage or another in their development the analysis contained in this section is indirectly a searching criticism of hedonism in all its forms end of translator's note pleasure and necessity self-consciousness which is aware of being the reality has its object within itself but an object which at first is merely its own for sich and is not yet in actual existence existence stands opposed to it as a reality other than its own and the aim of self-consciousness consists in carrying out what it is for itself so as to see itself as another independent being this first purpose is to become conscious in that other self-consciousness of itself as an individual to turn this other into its own self it has the assurance that this other already is essentially itself in so far as it has risen above the substance of ethical life and the quiescent state of thought and attained its conscious independence it has left behind the law of custom and of substantial existence the kinds of knowledge acquired through observation and the sphere of theory these lie behind it as a grey shadow that is just vanishing for this latter is rather a knowledge of something, the independent existence, für sich sein, and actuality of which are other than those of self-consciousness. Instead of being the seemingly heaven-born spirit of universality in knowledge and action, wherein the feeling and enjoyment of being an individual are stilled, the earth-born spirit has made its way to this new level of self-consciousness, and holds that being alone as true reality which is the reality of individual consciousness intellect and science are despised those highest gifts possessed by men the devil will now its master be and it must be o'erthrown it plunges into life and carries to its completion the pure individuality in which it appears it does not so much make its own happiness as take it directly and enjoy it the grey shades of science laws and principles which alone stand between it and its own reality vanish like a lifeless mist that cannot support the living certainty of its reality it takes to itself life much as ripe fruit is plucked which comes to meet the hand that takes it its action is only in one respect an act of desire it does not proceed to abolish the objective fact in its entirety but merely concerns itself with the form of its otherness or objectivity which is an unreal appearance for it holds this to be inherently and implicitly the same reality as its own self the sphere in which desire and its object subsist independently and indifferent towards each other is that of living existence the enjoyment of desire cancels this existence so far as concerns its being object of desire 
but here this element which gives to both separate and distinct actuality is rather the category a form of being which has essentially the character of a presentation it is therefore the consciousness of independence it may be natural consciousness or the consciousness developed into a system of laws which preserves individuals each for himself this separation does not in itself hold for self-consciousness which knows the other as its own proper selfhood it attains therefore to the enjoyment of pleasure to the consciousness of its actualization in a consciousness which appears as independent or to the intuition of the unity of both independent self-consciousnesses it succeeds in that purpose but only to learn there what the truth of that purpose is it conceives itself as this individual self-existent für sich sein being but the actualization of this purpose is just the cancelling of the purpose for it comes consciously to be not object in the sense of a given particular individual but rather as unity of itself and the other self-consciousness consequently as cancelled and transcended individual that is as universal the pleasure enjoyed has indeed the positive significance that the self has become aware of itself as objective self-consciousness but the negative import is there as well that of having cancelled itself and since it took its realization in the former sense only its experience comes consciously before it as contradiction in which the acquired reality of its individual existence finds itself destroyed by the negative element which stands without reality and without content over against the former and yet is the force which consumes it this negative element is nothing else than the notion of what this individuality inherently is this individuality is however as yet the poorest form of self-realizing mind for it is still simply the abstraction of reason or is the merely immediate unity of being for self and being in self für sich und an sich seins of explicit and implicit self its essential nature is only that of the abstract category still it has no longer the form of immediate simple being as in the case of observation where it is abstract being or when affirmed as something alien is thinghood in general here in the case before us there has entered into this thinghood self-existence für sich sein and mediation it comes on the scene here therefore in the form of a circular process whose content is the developed pure relation of simple ultimate elements the actualization attained in the case of this individuality consists therefore in nothing else than its having turned out this cycle of abstractions from the restricted confines of simple self-consciousness and put them into the sphere and condition of self-existence where they appear spread out in detail as distinct objects the sort of object then that self-consciousness in its pleasurable enjoyment takes to be its true reality is the detailed expansion of those bare essential elements of pure unity of bare difference and of their relation further than this the object which individuality finds to be its true nature has no content it is what is called necessity for necessity fate or the like is just that about which we are unable to say what it is doing what its definite laws and its positive content actually are because it is the absolute pure notion itself viewed as being relation bare and simple but imperturbable irresistible and immovable whose work is merely the nothingness of individual existence it is this firm unbending connection because the connecting factor consists in pure essentialities or empty abstractions unity difference and relation are categories each of which is nothing as it stands by itself but only in its relation to its opposite and they therefore cannot come apart from one another they are by their own notion related to each other for they are the pure notions themselves and this absolute relation and bare abstract process constitute necessity the merely particular individuality which has in the first instance only the pure notion of reason for its content instead of having escaped from dead theory and plunged into actual life has thus only precipitated itself into consciousness of its own lifelessness and finds its lot to be merely naked and alien necessity lifeless actuality the transition takes place from the form of oneness to that of universality from one absolute abstraction into the other it proceeds from that purpose of pure explicit existence for self which has cast off fellowship and communion with others into the sheer opposite 
that is into equally abstract implicit immanent existence into mere being in itself this appears consequently in such form that the individual is simply reduced to naught and the utter atomicity of separate individual existence is pulverized on the equally hard but continuous actuality since it is qua consciousness the unity of itself and its opposite this transaction is still a fact for it its purpose and its realization as well as the contradiction of what constituted its essential nature and what inherently that nature is all this it is consciously aware of it learns the double meaning which lies in what it does when it sought to take and possess its life it took life but thereby rather laid hold on death this transition of its living being into lifeless necessity appears to it therefore a perversion which is mediated by no agency at all the mediating factor would have to be that in which both sides would be one where consciousness thus knew the one moment in the other found its purpose and action in fate and its fate in its purpose and action saw its own true nature in this necessity but for consciousness the meaning of this unity here is just pleasure itself or simple particular feeling and the transition from the moment of this its purpose into the moment of its true nature is for it a mere leap into the opposite for these moments are not contained and combined in feeling but only in the bare pure self which is a universal or thought consciousness therefore through the experience in which its truth ought to have come to light has instead become to itself a dark riddle the consequences of its deeds are to it not really its own deeds what happens to it is found to be not the experience of what it inherently is the transition is not a mere alteration in form of the same content and essential nature presented now as content and true reality of consciousness thereafter as object or intuitively perceived essence of itself the abstract necessity thus gets the significance of the merely negativing uncomprehended power of universality on which individuality is broken in pieces the appearance of this mode of self-consciousness goes as far as this stage the last moment of the existence of this mode is the thought of the loss it suffers at the hands of necessity or the thought of itself as a being wesen, entirely alien to itself self-consciousness in itself however has survived this loss for this necessity or pure universality is its own proper nature wesen. this reflection of consciousness into self the knowledge that itself is necessity is a new mode or attitude of consciousness end of section twenty section twenty one of the phenomenology of mind volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phone the phenomenology of mind volume one by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey chapter five b subsection b the law of the heart and the frenzy of self-conceit translator's note the following section is an analysis of the mood of moral sentimentalism it is a mood of all times and appears in many forms but about hegel's times it became prominent in the romantic school and was frankly adopted as a practical attitude by certain of its representatives perhaps one of the most remarkable historic examples of sentimentalism was rousseau to whom so much in the romantic movement may be traced in the literature of hegel's time and indeed in all literature no more perfect type of sentimentalism can be found than goethe's werther with such instances as these in our minds the succeeding analysis requires neither explanation nor comment end of translator's note the law of the heart and the frenzy of self-conceit necessity is for this new mode of consciousness what in truth self-consciousness finds necessity in its own case to be in its new attitude self-consciousness regards itself as the necessary element it knows that it has the universal the law immediately within itself a law which because of this characteristic of being immediately within consciousness as it is for itself is called the law of the heart this mode or attitude of consciousness is for itself qua individual essential reality as the former mode similarly was but in the present case it is richer by the characteristic that the self-existence is taken as necessary or universal the law therefore which is primarily the law proper of self-consciousness or a heart which however has in it a law is the purpose which the self proceeds to realize 
it remains to be seen whether its realization corresponds to its notion and whether it will therein come to find this its law to be the essential ultimate fact opposed to this heart stands a reality for in the heart the law is in the first place merely for itself it is not yet actualized and thus too is something other than what the notion is this other is thereby characterized as a reality which is the antithesis of what is to be realized and consequently is the contradiction of the law and the individual this reality is thus on the one hand a law by which the particular individuality is crushed and oppressed a violent ordinance of the world which contradicts the law of the heart and on the other hand a humanity suffering under that ordinance a humanity which does not follow the law of the heart but is subjected to an alien necessity this reality appearing in opposition to the present mode of consciousness is as is evident nothing but the foregoing direction of individuality and its truth a relation of gruesome necessity under which the former is crushed we who trace the process see the preceding movement therefore as an opposition to the new form because the latter has essentially arisen from it and the moment whence the new form comes to the present stage is necessary for it the new mode however looks on that moment as something lying at hand something simply met with since it has no consciousness of its origin and takes its real essence to consist rather in being independent in being for itself or negatively disposed towards this positive implicit immanent content the aim and object of this individuality is thus to cancel and transcend this necessity which contradicts the law of the heart as also to do away with the suffering thereby arising there is in consequence no longer here the frivolity of the former mode which merely wanted some particular pleasure it is the earnestness of a high purpose which seeks its pleasure in displaying the excellence of its own true nature and in bringing about the welfare of mankind what it realizes is itself the law and its pleasure is at the same time universal a pleasure which all hearts feel to it both are inseparable its pleasure is what conforms to the law and the realization of the law of all mankind prepares the way for its particular pleasure for within its own self individuality and necessity are immediately and directly one the law is a law of the heart individuality is not yet removed from its place and the unity of both has not been brought about by the process mediating that unity has not yet been established by discipline the realization of the immediate undisciplined nature passes for a display of excellence and for bringing about the well-being of mankind the law again which is opposed to the law of the heart is divided from the heart and exists on its own account mankind which is bound to it does not live in the blissful unity of the law with the heart but either lives in dismal separation and suffering or at least in deprivation of the enjoyment of itself in obeying the law and without the consciousness of its own excellence in overstepping it because that all-dominating divine and human ordinance is divided from the heart it is regarded by the latter as a delusion which ought to lose what it still possesses namely power and objectivity it may indeed in its content agree by chance with the law of the heart and then the latter can acquiesce in it but for the heart it is not the bare conformity to law as such which constitutes the essential fact wesen, but the consciousness of itself which the heart thereby obtains the fact that it has therein found satisfaction where the content of universal necessity however does not agree with the heart necessity is also as regards its content nothing in itself and must give way before the law of the heart the individual then fulfils carries out the law of his heart this law becomes a universal ordinance and pleasure becomes a reality which as it stands conforms to law but in this realization the law has in point of fact escaped the individual and thus there arises immediately only that relation which ought to be cancelled the law of the heart ceases through its very realization to be a law of the heart for it thereby takes on the form of actually being and is now universal power which holds this particular heart to be a matter of indifference so that the individual in establishing his own ordinance no longer finds it to be his own by realizing his law he consequently brings about not his law but since the realization is inherently and implicitly his own but explicitly alien and external merely this he gets involved and entangled in the actual ordinance and indeed entangled in it not merely as something alien to himself 
but as a hostile overpowering dominion by this act he takes his place in or rather as the general element of existent actuality and his act is in his own regard intended to have the value of a universal ordinance but thereby he has let himself get detached from his own self qua universality he lives grows on his own account and gets rid of individuality the individual who recognizes universality merely in the form of his own immediate self-subsistence für sich sein does not therefore find himself in this liberated and independent universality while all the same he belongs to it because the latter is his doing this doing thus has the reverse significance it contradicts the universal ordinance for the individual's act is intended to be that of his individual heart and not independent universal reality and at the same time he has in fact recognized and acknowledged this latter for the act has the import of setting up his essential nature as free and independent reality that is to say of recognizing reality to be his own essential being the individual has by the very principle of his action determined the more special manner in which actual universality to which he has leagued himself gets turned against him his act qua actuality belongs to the universal its content however is his own individuality which being this particular individuality wants to preserve itself in opposition to universality it is not any specific law whose establishment was in question on the contrary this immediate unity of the individual heart with universality is the idea raised to the dignity of a law and claiming to be valid that every heart must know its own self in what is universal law but only the heart of this individual has established its reality in his act which in his view expresses his self-existence für sich sein or his pleasure the act is intended to stand immediately for what is universal that is to say it is in truth something particular and has merely the form of universality its particular content is as such to pass for universal hence others find in this content not the law of their heart fulfilled but rather that of someone else and even in view of the universal law that each is to find his own heart in what is law they turn against that reality which he set up just as he on his side turned against theirs the individual therefore finds as at first merely the rigid law so now the hearts of men themselves opposed to his excellent intentions and detesting them because this type of consciousness finds universality in the first place merely as immediate and knows necessity as necessity of the heart the nature of actualization and effective activity is to it unknown this consciousness is unaware that effective realization involves objective existence and is in truth the inherently universal in which the particular life of consciousness which commits itself to it in order to have a being in the sense of an immediate individual life is really submerged instead of obtaining this particular life of its own in that objective existence it thus becomes estranged from itself but that in which it does not know itself is no longer dead necessity but necessity animated by universal individuality it took this divine and human ordinance which it discovered in operation to be a dead reality wherein not only its own self which claims the position of a particular individual insists on being a particular heart with a life of its own and opposed to the universal but those as well who fall within this reality had no consciousness of themselves now however it finds that reality animated by the consciousness of all and a law for all hearts it learns through experience that the reality in question is an ordinance infused and endowed with life and learns this indeed just by the fact that it actualizes the law of its own heart for this means nothing else than that individuality becomes its own object in the form of universality without however knowing itself therein thus then what the experience of this mode of self-consciousness reveals as the truth contradicts what this mode takes itself to be what however it takes itself to be has for it the form of absolute universality and what is immediately one with consciousness of self is the law of the heart at the same time the stable living ordinance is likewise its own true nature and work it produces nothing else but that the latter is in direct immediate union with self-consciousness in this way self-consciousness here has the characteristic of belonging to a twofold antithetic essence it is inherently contradictory and torn to distraction in its inmost being the law of this individual heart is only that wherein self-consciousness knows itself 
but the universal and accepted ordinance has by actualizing that law become likewise its own essential nature and its own reality what thus contradicts itself within its consciousness has for it in both cases the character of essence and of being its own reality when it gives expression to this moment of conscious destruction and thereby expresses the result of its experience it shows itself to be this inner perversion of itself to be consciousness gone crazy its own essence being at once not essence its reality directly unreality the madness here cannot be taken to mean that in general something unessential is regarded as essential something unreal as real so that what for one is essential or actual might not be so for another and thus the consciousness of real and of unreal or of essential and unessential would fall apart if something in point of fact is real and essential for consciousness in general but for me is not so then in being conscious of its nothingness i have since i am consciousness in general at the same time the consciousness of its reality and since they both are fixed and rooted within me this is a union which is madness in general in this state however there is only one object deranged for consciousness not consciousness as such within itself and for itself but in the result of the process of experience which has here come about consciousness is in its law aware of itself as this individual reality and at the same time since precisely the same essential fact the same reality is estranged from it it is qua self-consciousness qua absolute reality aware of its unreality in other words both aspects are held in their contradiction to be directly its essence which is thus in its inmost being distracted the heart throb for the welfare of mankind passes therefore into the rage of frantic self-conceit into the fury of consciousness to preserve itself from destruction and to do so by casting out of its life the perversion which it really is and by straining to regard and to express that perversion as something else the universal ordinance and law it therefore now speaks of as an utter distortion of the law of its heart and of its happiness a perversion invented by fanatical priests by riotous revelling despots and their minions who seek to indemnify themselves for their own degradation by degrading an oppression in their turn a distortion practised to the nameless misery of deluded mankind consciousness in this its frenzy proclaims individuality to be deranging mad and perverted but this is an alien and accidental individuality it is the heart however or the particular consciousness immediately seeking to be universal that is thus raving and perverted and the outcome of its action is merely that this contradiction comes to its consciousness for the truth in its view is the law of its heart something merely intended which has not outlasted as the permanent ordinance has done but rather collapses when it comes face to face with this latter this its law ought to have reality herein the law has for it the sense of reality is a valid ordinance purpose and essential nature but that reality that very law as valid ordinance is at once and at the same time for it nothingness and void similarly its own reality proper itself as particular consciousness is in its view the essential truth its purpose however is to establish that particularity as existent it does prima facie and in the first instance takes itself qua not individual to be the truly real or purpose in the sense of law and hence precisely a universality which it is to be objectively as a conscious fact this its notion comes by its own act to be its object its individual self is thus discovered to be unreal and unreality it finds out to be its reality it is thus not an accidental and alien individuality but just this particular heart in every respect inherently perverted and perverting since however the directly universal individuality is that condition of perversion this universal ordinance being the law of all hearts and so of the perverted consciousness is no less itself in its very nature the perverted element as indeed raging frenzy declared on the one hand this ordinance proves itself to be a law for all hearts by the resistance which the law of one heart meets with from other individuals the accepted and established laws are defended against the law of a single individual because they are not empty necessity unconscious and dead but have spiritual substance and universality in which those in whom the spiritual substance is realized live as individuals and are conscious of their own selves 
hence even when they complain of this ordinance as if it went contrary to their own inmost law and maintain in opposition to it the claims of the heart in point of fact they inwardly cling to it as being their essential nature and if they are deprived of this ordinance or put themselves outside the range of its influence they lose everything since then it is precisely in this that the reality and power of public ordinance consists the latter appears as the essence self-identical and everywhere alive and individuality appears as its form on the other hand however this ordinance is the sphere of perversion for in that this ordinance is the law of all hearts in that all individuals are immediately this universal it is a reality which is only that of self-existing individuality that is of the heart when consciousness therefore sets up the law of its heart it finds itself resisted by others and the latter in opposing it are doing nothing else but setting up in their turn and making valid their own law the universal which comes out therefore is only a universal resistance and struggle of all against one another in which each makes good his own individuality but at the same time does not come off successfully because each individuality meets with the same opposition and each is reciprocally dissipated by the others what appears as public ordinance is thus the state of war of each against all in which every one for himself rests what he can executes even-handed justice upon the individual lives of others and establishes his own individual existence which in its turn vanishes at the hands of others we have here the course of the world the mere semblance of a constant regular trend which is only a pretense of universality and whose content is rather the meaningless insubstantial sport of setting up individual beings as fixed and stable and then dissipating them if we put both sides of the universal ordinance over against one another and consider them we see that this later universality has for its content restless individuality which regards opinion or the merely particular as law the real as unreal and the unreal as real that universality is however at the same time the side of realization of the ordinance for to it belongs the independent self-existence feel sich sein of individuality the other side is the universal in the sense of stable passive essence but for that very reason the universal is only something inner which is not indeed absolutely non-existent but still not an actual reality and can itself only become actual by cancelling the individuality that has presumed to claim actuality this type of consciousness which becomes aware of itself in the law in what is inherently true and good not as particular or individual but only as essentially real yet knows individuality to be what is perverted and perverting and hence feels bound to surrender and sacrifice particularity of consciousness this type of consciousness is virtue end of section twenty one section twenty two of the phenomenology of mind volume one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5b, Subsection C. Virtue and the Course of the World. Translator's Note. The mood of moral sentimentalism is reduced to confusion and contradiction but the subjective individualism in which it is rooted is not yet eradicated individualism now takes refuge in another attitude which claims to do greater justice to the inherent universality of rational self-realization but yet clings to its particular individuality as an inalienable possession it now tries to make the realization of universal purposes in the shape of the good depend solely on its own activity the objective sphere in which the good is to be carried out being regarded as at once external to its ends opposing its activity and yet requiring these ends to be carried out in order to have any moral significance individualism looks on the good as its private perquisite and makes a personal merit and glory out of its action in carrying out the good this external realm is the course of the world which in itself is thought to contain no goodness and which only gets a value if the good is realized in it the world's course is thus to owe its goodness to the efforts of the individual a struggle ensues for the situation is contradictory and the issue of the struggle goes to prove that the individual is not the fons et origi boni 
that goodness does not await his efforts and that in fact the course of the world is at heart good the soul of the world is righteous the attitude analyzed here is that of abstract moral idealism the mood of moral strenuousness the mood that constantly seeks the improvement and perfectibility of mankind it is found in many forms but particularly wherever there is any strong enmity between the ideal life and the life of the world end of translator's note virtue and the course of the world in the first mode of active reason self-consciousness felt it was pure individuality and over against this stood empty universality in the second the two factors in the antithesis had each both the moments within them both law and individuality the one factor the heart was their immediate unity the other their opposition here in the relation of virtue and the course of the world both members are each severally unity and antithesis of the moments are each a process but in the opposite direction of law and individuality inter se for the virtuous consciousness law is the essential element and individuality the one to be superseded and cancelled both in the case of its own conscious life as well as in that of the course of the world in the former case the private individuality claimed by any one has to be brought under the discipline and control of the universal the inherently good and true it remains there however still a personal consciousness true cultivation and discipline consist solely in the surrender of the entire personality as a way of making sure that in point of fact individual peculiarities are no longer asserted and insisted on in this individual surrender individuality as it is found in the world's process is at the same time annihilated for individuality is also a simple moment common to both in the world's process individuality adopts a position the reverse of what it is in the case of the virtuous consciousness that is that of making itself the essential factor and subordinating to its own ends the inherently good and true further the course of the world too does not as regards virtue mean merely a universal thus overturned and perverted through individuality absolute law and order form likewise a common moment consciously found to be in the world's process not however in the sense of an existing actual fact but as the inmost essence of the process that regulative order therefore has not properly speaking to be first produced by virtue for the production of it means qua action a consciousness of individuality and consists rather in superseding the latter by thus cancelling individuality however the inherent nature of the world's process merely gets room as it were to enter real existence independently on its own account an und für sich selbst the general content of the actual course of the world has already made itself known looked at more closely it is again nothing else than the two preceding movements of self-consciousness from them has come virtue shape and mould for since they originated virtue has them before it its aim however is to supersede its source and origin and realize itself or be for itself become objectively explicit the way of the world is thus from one point of view particular individuality seeking its pleasure and enjoyment finding itself overthrown in doing so and as a result satisfying the demands of the universal but this satisfaction like the rest of the moments of this relationship is a perverted state and process of the universal the real fact is merely the particular pleasure and enjoyment while the universal is opposed to it a necessity which is only the empty shape of universality a merely negative reaction the form of an act without any content the other moment of the world's process is individuality which wants to be a law independently and on its own account and under the influence of this conceit upsets the established regular order the universal law no doubt manages to hold its own against this sort of conceit and no longer appears in the form of an empty opposite over against consciousness does not play the role of a lifeless necessity but is a necessity operating within the conscious life itself but in the sense in which it is a reality existing in a conscious state of absolute contradiction it is madness while in the sense in which it is an objective reality it is simply utter perversion the universal then in both aspects proves to be the might that moves them but the existential form this force assumes is merely that of general perversion it is from virtue that the universal is now to receive its true reality by cancelling individuality the principle of perversion virtue's purpose is by this means to transmute again the perverted world's process and bring out its true inner nature 
this true being is in the world process merely in the form of its implicit inherent nature it is not yet actual and hence virtue merely believes it virtue proceeds to raise this faith to sight without however enjoying the fruit of its labour and sacrifice for so far as it is individuality it is the active carrying on of the contest which it wages with the world's process its purpose and true nature however lie in conquering the reality of the world's process and the existence of the good thereby effectuated carries with it the cessation of its action that is of the consciousness of individuality how the struggle itself will come off what virtue finds out in the course of it whether by the sacrifice which virtue takes upon itself to undergo the world's process succumbs while virtue triumphs all this must be decided from the nature of the living weapons the combatants carry for the weapons are nothing else than the essential being of the combatants themselves a being which only makes its appearance for them both reciprocally what their weapons are is in this way already evident from what is inherently implied in the struggle the universal is an authentic element for the virtuous consciousness as a matter of belief it is implicitly or inherently true not yet an actual but an abstract universality it plays the part of purpose in the case of this consciousness and of inner principle in that of the world's process precisely by having this character the universal also manifests itself in the relation of virtue to the world's process for virtue first wills to carry out the good and does not in the first instance claim reality for it this characteristic can also be looked at in this way the good in that it comes on the scene in the struggle with the world's process thereby manifests itself in the form of what is for another as something which is not self-contained an und für sich selbst for otherwise it would not want to get at its own truth by vanquishing its opposite by having its being only when it is for another is meant the same as was shown in the opposite way of looking at it that is that it is to begin with an abstraction which only attains reality in a relation and has no reality of itself as it stands the good or universal as it appears here is then what is called gifts capacities powers it is a mode or form of spiritual life where it is presented as a universal which requires the principle of individuality to give it life and movement and in individuality finds its realization this universal is applied well by the principle of individuality so far as this principle dwells in the consciousness of virtue and misused by it so far as it is in the world's process a passive instrument which can be regulated and directed by the hand of free individuality quite irrespective of the use it is put to and can be misused for the production of a reality which means its ruin a lifeless material deprived of its own independence a material that can be formed in this way or that or even to its own destruction since this universal is at the beck and call equally of the virtuous consciousness as well as of the course of the world it is not apparent whether this equipment virtue would get the better of vice the weapons are the same these capacities and powers virtue has it is true carefully ensconced its belief in the original unity of its purpose and the essential nature of the world's process and the reserve thus placed in ambush is intended to fall on the rear of the enemy during the fight and per se accomplish its own purpose so that thereby the knight of virtue finds as a matter of fact that his part in waging this warfare is properly speaking a mere sham fight which he cannot take seriously because he puts all his strength and confidence in the good being self-sufficient and real per se that is in the bringing about of its own fulfilment a sham fight which he dare not even allow to become serious for what he turns against the enemy and finds turned against himself and what both in his own case and as regards his enemy as well he runs the risk of getting wasted and damaged in the struggle is not the good itself he fights to keep and carry that out what is exposed to the hazard of the contest is merely gifts and capacities that are indifferent to the issue but these in point of fact are nothing else than just that universal from which individuality has been eliminated and which is to be conserved and actualized by the struggle this universal however is at the same time directly realized and ipso facto made actual by the very notion of the contest it is the inherent essential nature the universal and its actualization means merely that it is at the same time for another the two aspects mentioned above in each of which it became an abstraction are no longer separated it is in and through the struggle that the good is primarily affirmed and established in both forms
the virtuous consciousness however enters into conflict with the way of the world as if this were a factor opposed to the good what the conflict brings to light is the universal not merely as an abstract universal but as one animated by individuality and existing for another in other words the universal in the sense of the actually real good wherever virtue comes to grips with the world's process it always hits upon places where goodness is found to exist the good as the inherent nature of the world's process is inseparably interwoven with all the manifestations of it with all the ways in which the world's process makes its appearance and where it is real the good has its own existence too virtue thus finds the world's process invulnerable all the moments which virtue was to jeopardize in itself when dealing with the world's process all the moments which it was to sacrifice these are just so many ways in which goodness exists and consequently are inviolable relations the conflict can therefore only be an oscillation between conserving and sacrificing or rather there can be no place for either sacrificing one's own or doing harm to what comes from elsewhere virtue is not merely like a combatant whose sole concern in the fight is to keep his sword well burnished but it has even started to fight simply to preserve its weapons and not merely is it unable to use its own weapons but it must also preserve intact those of its enemy and protect them against its own attack seeing they are all noble parts of the good on behalf of which it enters the field of battle this enemy on the other hand has as its essential element not the inherent universal but individuality its forces thus the negative principle before which nothing stands nothing is absolutely sacred but which can risk and endure the loss of everything and anything in so doing it feels victory to be assured as much from its very nature as by the contradiction in which its opponent gets entangled what is to virtue implicit and inherent is taken merely as an explicit objective fact in the case of the world's process the latter is detached from every moment which virtue finds fixed and to which it is fast secured the world process has such a moment under its power and has consequently in its control the tethered knight of virtue bound thereto by the fact that this moment is held to be merely one which the world's process can as readily cancel as let be this knight of valor cannot work himself loose from it as he might from a cloak thrown round him and get free by leaving it behind for it is to him the essential element which there is no getting rid of finally as to the ambush out of which the inherent good is cunningly and craftily to fall on the rear of the world's process this hope is vain and foolish from its very nature the world's process is the mind sure of itself and ever on the alert that can never be got at from behind but fronts breast forward every quarter for it consists in this that everything is an objective element for it everything stands before it but when the inherent goodness is for its enemy then it finds itself in the struggle we have seen so far however as it is not for its enemy but subsists in itself it is the passive instrument of gifts and capacities material without reality if represented as object it would be a dormant consciousness remaining in the background no one knows where virtue will thus be overpowered by the world's process because the abstract unreal essence is in fact virtue's own purpose and because its action as regards reality rests on distinctions that are solely a matter of words virtue wanted to consist in the fact of bringing about the realization of goodness through sacrificing individuality but the aspect of reality is itself nothing else than the aspect of individuality the good was meant to be what is implicit and inherent and opposed to what is but the implicit and inherent taken in its real truth is simply being itself the implicitly inherent element is primarily the abstraction of essence as against actual reality but the abstraction is just what is not true but a distinction merely for consciousness this means however it is itself what is called actual for the actual is what essentially is for another or it is being but the consciousness of virtue rests on this distinction of implicitness and explicit being a distinction without any true validity the world's process was to be the perversion of the good because it took individuality for its principle but this latter is the principle of actual reality for it is just that mode of consciousness by which what is implicit and inherent is for another as well the world's process transmutes and perverts the unchangeable but does so in fact by transmuting it out of the nothingness of abstraction into the being of reality 
the way of the world is then victorious over what in opposition to it constitutes virtue it is victorious over that whose nature is an unreal abstraction but it is not victorious over something real but over the production of distinctions that are no distinctions over this pompous talk about the best for mankind and the oppression of humanity about sacrifice for goodness sake and the misuse of gifts imaginary idealities and purposes of that sort fall on the ear as idle phrases which exalt the heart and leave the reason a blank which edify but build up nothing that endures declamations whose only definite announcement is that the individual who professes to act for such high ends and indulges in such fine phrases holds himself for a fine creature a swollen enlargement which gives itself and others a mighty size of a head but big from inflation with emptiness virtue in the olden time had its secure and determinate significance for it found the fullness of its content and its solid basis in the substantial life of the nation and had for its purpose and end a concrete good that existed and lay at its hand it was also for that reason not directed against actual reality as a general perversity and not turned against the world process the virtue above considered however is removed from that substantial life and is outside it a virtue with no essential being a virtue merely an idea and in words and one that is deprived of all that content the vacuousness of this rhetorical eloquence in conflict with the world's process would be at once discovered if it could be stated what all its eloquent phrases amount to they are therefore assumed to be familiar and well understood to request to say what then this well known is would be either met by a new swell of phrases or in reply there would be an appeal to the heart which inwardly tells what they mean which is tantamount to an admission of inability to say what the meaning is the fatuousness of that style of eloquence seems too in a quasi-unconscious manner to have got the length of being an acknowledged certainty for the cultivated minds of our time since all interest in the whole mass of those rhetorical spread-eagle phrases has disappeared a loss of interest which is betrayed in the sheer wearisomeness they produce the result then arising from this opposition consists in the fact that consciousness lets the idea of an inherent good which yet has no actual reality slip from it like a mere cloak consciousness has learned in the course of its struggle that the world's process is not so bad as it looked for the reality of the world's process is that of the universal with the discovery of this it is seen that there is no way of producing the good through the sacrifice of individuality the means for doing so have gone for individuality is precisely the explicit actualization of what is implicitly and inherently real that is the universal and the perversion ceases to be looked at as a perversion of goodness for it is just the transmuting of the good qua bare purpose into actual reality the moving process of individuality is the realizing of the universal in point of fact however what as world process that opposed to the consciousness of the inherently and implicitly real has likewise been vanquished and has disappeared with the attainment of the above result the self-existence of individuality was there in opposition to the inner essential nature the universal and made its appearance as a reality cut off from the inherent implicit nature since however it has come out that reality is an undivided unity with the universal the self-existence of the world's process proves to have no longer a being just as the inherent nature an sich, of virtue is merely an aspect too an sich. the individuality of the world's process may doubtless think it acts merely for itself or selfishly it is better than it thinks its action is at the same time one that is universal and with an inherent being of its own if it acts selfishly it does not know what it is doing and if it insists that all men act selfishly it merely asserts that all men are unaware as to what action is if it acts for itself this is just the explicit bringing into reality of what is at first implicit and inherent the purpose of its self-existence of its being for itself which it fancies opposed to the inherent nature its futile ingenuity and cunning as also its fine-spun explanations which so knowingly demonstrate the existence of selfishness everywhere all these have as much vanished as the purpose of the inherent element and its rhetorical eloquence thus then the effort the struggle the activity of individuality is inherently an end in itself the use of powers the play of their outward manifestations that is what gives them life otherwise they would be lifeless potential and merely implicit 
an sich. The inherent implicit nature is not an abstract universal without existence and never carried into effect. It is itself immediately this actual present and this living actuality of the process of individuality. End of section 22「Section 23 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5c. Individuality, which takes itself to be real in and for itself. Translator's Note. The following section gives a general description of individuality which seeks to realize itself, not in the one-sided ways analyzed in the three preceding sections, but as a complete concrete whole. Here individuality does not regard itself abstractly, and hence does not treat the sphere of its realization as in any way alien to itself. It is completely one with the objective world where it carries out its ends, and finds both itself adequate to its own realization and the world sufficient and all-sufficient for the embodiment of its ends. In this sphere we have, as it were, the very antithesis of the preceding state of mind. There the good was opposed to the course of the world, the latter being dependent for its goodness on individual effort. Here it is as if the world were made up of the activity of individuals and were wholly adequate to satisfy and embody all their ends. Naturally, therefore, individuals take themselves here to be real just as they are, and have merely to express or develop their own content in order to objectify their ends. The objective world is their activity realized, is themselves externalized. The condition of individuality is the immediate preparation for the social order of the life of a free spiritual community, and is the anticipation of that community, a community where the individual is universalized through union with the whole, and the whole particularized in the individual. End of translator's note individuality which takes itself to be real in and for itself self-consciousness has now grasped its own principle which at first sight was only our notion of it that is the notion that when consciously certain of itself it is all reality its purpose and nature henceforward consist in the interpenetration of the universal elements its gifts and capacities and individual existence the particular moments of this process of complete concrete permeation preceding the unity in which they now combine in a single fused whole were found in the purposes hitherto considered these have now ceased to be abstractions and chimeras belonging to those earlier empty modes of the self-consciousness of mind modes whose true nature lies simply in the would-be life of the heart fancy and mere rhetoric and not in reason which is now sure of its own reality as it stands an und für sich and no longer seeks to take up the position of being only a purpose in opposition to immediately existent sensible reality but on the contrary has the category as such as the object of its consciousness this means that the character of being for itself on its own account für sich, or of negative self-consciousness with which reason started is cancelled the self-consciousness at that stage fell in with the reality which would be its own negative and by cancelling which it would consciously realize its purpose. Now that purpose and inherent nature, an sich sein, have proved to be the same as objective existence for another and a given reality, objective truth is no longer divided from subjective certainty. The purpose set up may now be taken for certainty of self, and a realization of that purpose for truth, or again purpose may be taken for the truth, and reality for certainty the essential nature and purpose as it stands an und für sich constitute the certainty of immediate reality itself the interpenetration of the inherent implicit nature an sich and the explicit distinctive nature für sich of the universal and individuality action is per se its truth and reality and the manifestation or expression of individuality is its purpose taken just as it stands with the attainment of such a conception therefore Self-consciousness has returned into itself and passed from those opposite characteristics which the category presented, and which its relations to the category had, when it was observing and when it was active. Its object is now the category pure and simple, 
in other words it is itself the category become conscious of itself its account with the previous forms is now closed they lie behind it in the past they do not come forward as a world found ready to hand but are developed solely within itself as transparent moments yet they still fall apart at this stage as a movement of distinct moments which has not yet got combined into its own substantial unity but throughout all these moments self-consciousness holds firmly to that simple unity of self with objective existence which is its constitutive nature or generic attribute consciousness has in this way cast free from all opposition and from every condition limiting its activity it starts anew from itself and is occupied not with something external but with itself since individuality is in itself actuality the material of operation and the purpose of action lie in the action itself action consequently has the appearance of a circular process which moves freely in vacuo within itself which unimpeded now enlarges and then contracts and is quite content to play simply within itself and with itself when individuality manifests and displays its form and shape this means that it simply assumes and receives this form that is its element it is just the light of day to which consciousness wants to show itself here action alters nothing opposes nothing it is the mere form of transition from a condition of being invisible to one of being visible and the content brought thus to daylight and laid bare is nothing else than what this action already is implicitly an sich it is implicit that is its form as unity in thought and it is actual that is its form as unity in existence while it is itself content merely in virtue of its maintaining this character of simplicity in spite of the aspect of change process and transition End of section 23section 24 of the phenomenology of mind volume 1 this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phone the phenomenology of mind volume 1 by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey chapter 5c subsection a society as a herd of individuals deceit actual fact translator's note this section seems at first sight a strained interpretation of the life of society there seems at first glance nothing in a society corresponding to the view here put forward but a little reflection will show that the conception of society here analyzed is a necessary and universal element in every society in order to form a free spiritual community individuals must be each complete in himself be real just as they are as concrete individuals so conceived the component individuals of a society are separate cells of the organism of a society all self-complete all implicitly universal and capable of being universalized but qua individuals all distinct together they form the elements out of which the compact structure of a society is made and without their being so together as they are thus constituted that structure would be impossible their togetherness as individual units each self-contained is not merely the basis of complete social life but the prima facie aspect of social life and the original primitive condition of social individuality here each seeks to realize his own ends quite naturally and spontaneously and is hardly aware and is almost indifferent to the universal result which his implicit universal nature must bring about each acts in his own interest little knowing that his interest must lead to the universal good his attitude is not strictly selfishness it is self-interest and such an interest all his ends must have because they are the ends of his self the reality he brings about has to be expressed he never questions his right to be just because he is self-complete the reality is indeed a genuine reality a reality with a universal character it is so much actual fact for him which he takes or makes and accepts just because it has a universal significance all the individuals are in the same position each is in touch with and is only concerned about actual fact each is thus equally honest with himself in seeking his own interest in being concerned with his own actual fact and each is equally honourable as regards others in so doing but still each is throughout focusing the meaning of the whole exclusively in himself and is not consciously going beyond himself for in a sense he does not need or wish to do so all the same this very fact he deals with has a universal significance and holds for others and can only be a fact if it does 
hence in so keeping up this individual interest in actual fact each is really deceiving himself as to its true meaning and deceiving others at the same time the situation is one of unconscious self-sophistication and unconscious deceiving of others as to their true inner spiritual affinity this social attitude is thus bound to prove inadequate and give way to the fuller social consciousness of a concrete community social life as here analyzed may be said to be society as it is conceived by the abstract political economist the economic order of society is a necessary moment in the life of society but the economic man is little better than an anthropotherian the section may be regarded as a satirical analysis of such an abstract entity it is also an indirect criticism of the futility of opposing egoism and altruism the position in which individuals are when acting in the manner above described corresponds precisely to that of a herd of animals hence the title of the present section End of translator's note. Society as a herd of individuals, deceit, actual fact. The above substantial individuality, to begin with, is again particular and determinate. Absolute reality, which it knows itself to be, is thus, in the way it is consciously aware of that reality, abstract and universal, without filling and content, merely the empty thought of this category. We have to see how this conception of substantial individuality is made explicit in its various moments and how it gets to be conscious of its true nature the conception of this individuality as it takes itself as such to be all reality is in the first instance a mere result its own movement and reality are not yet set forth it is here in its immediacy as something purely and simply implicit negativity however which is the same as what appears as movement and process is inherent in this implicit nature as a specific quality and being the simple implicit nature comes to be a definite compass or range of being individuality confronts us therefore as an original determinate nature original in virtue of its being implicit originally determinate in virtue of the negative moment lying in that implicitness which negative element is thereby a quality this limitation cannot however limit the action of consciousness for this consists at the present stage in thorough and complete self-reference relation to what is other than itself which would be a limitation is now overcome the character inherent originally by nature is thus merely an undefined simple principle a transparent universal element in which individuality finds itself free and at one with itself as well as enfolds its diversity without restraint and in realizing itself is simply in reciprocal relation with itself we have here something similar to what we find in the case of indeterminate animal life this breeds the breath of life let us say in the water as its element or air or earth and within these again in still more determinate conditions every aspect of its life is affected by the specific element and yet animal life still keeps these aspects within its power and itself a unity in spite of the limitations of the element and remains quite a given particular organization animal life throughout the same general fact of animal life this determinate original nature of consciousness in which it finds itself freely and wholly appears as the immediate and only proper content of the purpose of the individual that content is indeed a definite content but is only content so far as we take the implicit nature in isolation in truth however it is reality realität permeated by individuality actuality wirklichkeit in the way consciousness qua individual contains this within itself and is to begin with taken as existing but not yet as acting so far as action is concerned however that determinateness is in one respect not a limitation it wants to overcome for looked at as an existent quality that determinateness is simply the colour of the element where it moves in another respect however the negativity is determinateness merely in the case of what exists but acting is nothing else than this negativity hence when individuality acts its specific determinateness is dissipated into the general process of negation into the sum and substance of all determinateness the simple original nature now breaks up in action and the consciousness of action into the distinction which action implies to begin with action is here an object an object too still belonging to consciousness it is present as a purpose and thus opposed to a given reality 
the other moment is the process of the statically presented purpose the process of actualization of the purpose bringing the purpose to bear on the entirely formal reality and hence is the idea of the transition itself in other words the second moment is the means the third moment is finally the object no longer as immediately and subjectively presented purpose but as brought to light and established as something other than and external to the acting subject these various aspects must be viewed in the light of the general principle of the sphere of consciousness the content throughout remains the same without any difference whether between individuality and existence in general or between purpose as against individuality in the sense of an original nature or between purpose and a given reality or between the means and that reality as absolute purpose or finally between the reality moulded by the agent as against the purpose the original nature or the means at the outset then the nature of individuality in its original determinate form its immediate essence is not yet affirmed as active and in this shape is called special capacity talent character and so on this peculiar colouring of mind must be looked at as the only content of its purpose and as the sole and only reality if we thought of consciousness as going beyond that as seeking to bring into reality another content then we should think of it as a nothing working away towards nothing this original nature is moreover not merely the substance of its purpose but implicitly the reality as well which otherwise assumes the appearance of being a given material on which to act of being found ready at hand for action to work up into some determinate form that is to say acting is simply transferring from a state not yet explicitly expressed to one fully expressed the inherent being of that reality opposed to consciousness has sunk to the level of a mere empty appearance a mere seeming this mode of consciousness by determining itself to act thereby refuses to be led astray by the semblance of reality on the part of what is presented to it and has likewise to abandon its dealings with idle thoughts and purposes and keep its hold on the original content of its own nature no doubt this content first exists as a fact for consciousness when it has made that content actual but the distinction between something which while for consciousness is only inside itself and a reality outside consciousness existing in itself has broken down consciousness must act only that what it inherently and implicitly is may be for it explicitly or acting is just a process of mind coming to be qua consciousness what it is implicitly therefore it knows from its actual reality hence it is that an individual cannot know what he is till he has made himself real by action consciousness however seems on this view to be unable to determine the purpose of its action before action has taken place but before action occurs it must in virtue of being consciousness have the act in front of itself as entirely its own that is as a purpose the individual therefore who is going to act seems to find himself in a circle where each moment already presupposes the others and hence seems unable to find a beginning because it only gets to know its own original nature the nature which is to be its purpose by first acting while in order to act it must have that purpose beforehand but just for that reason it has to start straight away and whatever the circumstances are without troubling further about beginning means or end proceed to action at once for its essential and implicit ansichseinde nature is beginning means and end all in one as beginning it is found in the circumstances of the action and the interest which the individual finds in something is just the answer to the question whether he should act and what is to be done in a given case for what seems to be a reality confronting him is implicitly his own original fundamental nature which has merely the appearance of an objective being an appearance which lies in the notion of action involving as this does self diremption but which expressly shows itself to be his own original nature by the interest the individual finds therein similarly the how the means is determined as it stands an und für sich talent is likewise nothing but individuality with a definite original constitution looked at as the subjective internal means or transition of purpose into actuality the actual means however and the real transition are the unity of talent with the nature of the fact as present in the interest felt the former talent expresses that aspect of the means which concerns action the latter the fact found of interest that which concerns content both are individuality itself as a fused whole of acting and existing 
what we find then is first circumstances given ready to hand which are implicitly the original nature of the individual next the interest which affirms them as its own or as its purpose and finally the connection and sublation of these opposite elements in the means this connection itself still falls within consciousness and the whole just considered is one side of an opposition this appearance of opposition which still remains is removed by the transition that is by the means for the means is a unity of inner and outer the antithesis of the determinate character it has qua inner means that is talent it therefore abolishes this character and makes itself this unity of action and existence equally an outer that is the actually realized individuality that is individuality which is established for individuality itself as the objectively existent the entire act in this way does not go beyond itself either as circumstances or as purpose or means or as work performed in this notion of work however the distinction which lay within the original nature seems to enter the work done is something determinate like the original nature it expresses because being cut loose by the process of acting and becoming an existing reality the negation implied in this process remained in it as a quality consciousness however as against the work is specifically that in which this quality as a general process of negation as acting is to be found it is thus the universal as opposed to the specific determinateness of the work performed it can therefore compare one kind of work with another and thence apprehend individualities themselves as different an individual who is of wider compass in his work has either stronger energy of will or a richer nature that is a nature whose original constitution esteemed height is less limited while another has a weaker and a poorer nature in contrast with this purely quantitative difference which is not an essential difference good and bad would express an absolute difference but this is not in place here whether taken in one way or another action is equally carried on there is a process of displaying and expressing an individuality and for that reason it is all good it would properly speaking be impossible to say what bad is to be here what would be called a bad work is the individual life of a certain specific nature which is therein realized it would only be degraded into bad work by a reflective comparison which however is quite empty and futile since this goes beyond the essential meaning and nature of work which is a self-expression of individuality and then seeks to find and demand from it heaven knows what else the comparison could have to do only with the distinction above mentioned but this being a distinction of quantity is in itself not an essential one and is only made here because of differences in works and individualities which might be compared with one another but these do not affect one another each is concerned simply with itself the original nature is alone the essential fact or what could be used as an ultimate standard of judgment regarding the work and conversely both however correspond to each other there is nothing for individuality which is not obtained through it or there is no reality which is not its nature and its action and no action nor inherent substance of individuality which is not real and only these moments are to be compared there is therefore in general no ground for feeling elevated or for lamenting or repenting all that sort of thing arises from a reflection which imagines another content and another inner nature than is to be found in the original nature of the individual and the actual carrying of it out into reality whatever it is that the individual does and whatever happens to him that the individual has done and is that himself he can only have the consciousness of the mere transference of his self from the darkness of possibility to the daylight of the present from a state abstract and implicit to the significance of actual being and can have only the certainty that what seems to him in the second state is nothing else than what lay dormant in the former the consciousness of this unity is no doubt likewise a comparison but what is compared is just a mere appearance of opposition a formal appearance which for reason qua self-conscious and aware that individuality is inherently actuality is nothing more than seeming the individual therefore knowing that he can find in his objective actuality nothing but its unity with himself or can find only the certainty of himself in its very truth and knowing that he thus always attains his purpose can experience only a sense of joy in himself that then is the conception consciousness has of itself when it is sure of its being an absolute identification a complete permeation 
of individuality and existence let us see whether this notion is confirmed and supported by its experience and whether its reality agrees with this notion the work produced is the reality which consciousness gives itself it is there that the individual becomes consciously what he is implicitly and in such wise that the consciousness which becomes aware of the individual in the work performed is not a particular consciousness but universal consciousness he has placed himself by his work quite outside in the element of universality in the characterless qualityless region of existence the consciousness which withdraws from its work is in point of fact universal because it becomes in this opposition between work and consciousness absolute negativity the process of action and stands over against its work which is determinate and particular it thus goes beyond itself qua work and is itself the indeterminate region which its work still leaves void and unfilled if their unity was in the above notion still preserved this took place just through the work being cancelled qua objectively existing product but it has to be and we have to see how individuality will retain its universality in the existence of the work and will know how to get satisfaction to begin with we have to consider by itself the work which has to come into being it has carried with it the entire nature of the individual its existence is therefore itself an action in which all distinctions interpenetrate and are resolved the work is thus thrown out in a subsisting form where the specific character of the original nature does in fact come out as against other determinate natures encroaches on them just as these do in their turn and is lost as a vanishing moment in this general process although in the conception of individuality is here dealt with the various moments circumstances purpose means and realization are all alike and the original specific nature stands for no more than a universal element on the other hand when this element takes on an objective existence its determinate character as such comes to light in the work done and preserves its truth in its dissolution looked at more closely this dissolution is such that in this specific character the individual as a particular individual has become consciously real but the specific character is not merely the content of reality but form as well or reality as such is as a whole just this determinateness of being opposed to self-consciousness on this view it is seen to be an alien reality which has disappeared out of the notion and is merely found given the work is that is it is for other individuals and for them it is an external an alien reality in whose place they have to put their own in order to get by their action consciousness of their unity with reality in other words the interest which they take in that work owing to their original constitution is other than the peculiar interest of this work which thereby is turned into something different the work is thus in general something transitory which is extinguished by the counteraction of other powers and interests and displays the reality of individuality in a transitory form rather than as fulfilled and accomplished consciousness then by doing work becomes aware of that contrast between being and acting which in the earlier forms of consciousness was at the same time the beginning of action and is here merely a result this contrast however was in fact likewise the ultimate principle involved when consciousness proceeded to act as an implicitly real individuality for action presupposed the determinate original nature as the ultimate implicit element and a mere process of performing the act for the sake of this performance took that nature as its content mere action is however the self-identical form with which consequently the specific determinateness of the original nature does not agree it is matter of indifference here as elsewhere which of the two is called notion and which reality the original nature is the thought element the implicit factor as against the action in which it first gets its reality or again the original nature is the existence both of individuality as such and of individuality in the form of work while action is the original notion as pure and simple transition as the process of becoming this lack of correspondence between idea and reality which lies in its essence consciousness learns in its work in work consciousness becomes aware of itself as it in truth is and its empty notion of itself disappears in this fundamental contradiction characteristic of work which contains the truth of all this individuality that takes itself to be inherently real all the aspects of individuality thus appear again as contradictory in other words work being the content of the entire individuality put forth by action 
which is the negative unity and holds in its grasp all the elements now sets them free when it is given existence as subsisting they stand indifferently over against each other the notion and its reality are thus separated into purpose and the original essential nature wesenheit it is an accident that the purpose should have a true being or that the implicit inherent nature should be made a purpose similarly again notion and reality fall apart as transition to actuality and its purpose in other words it is an accident that the means expressing the purpose should actually be chosen well finally should these inner moments taken together have some intrinsic unity or not the action of the individual is once more an accident so far as actuality in general is concerned fortune decides in favour of a badly determined purpose and badly selected means just as much as against them if now consciousness hereby becomes aware in its work of the opposition between willing and performance between purpose and means and again between this inward nature taken altogether and actual reality an opposition which as a whole shows the fortuitous character of the action of consciousness still the unity and the necessity of this action are just as much present too this latter aspect transcends the former and experience of the fortuitousness of the action is itself only fortuitous kind of experience the necessity of the action consists in this that purpose is directly related to actuality and the unity of these is the very notion of action the act takes place because action is per se and of itself the essence of actuality in work there no doubt comes out the fortuitousness which characterizes accomplishment when contrasted with willing and the process of performing and this experience which seems as if it must be the truth contradicts that notion of the act still if we look at the content of this experience taken in its completeness that content is seen to be the transitory work what persists is not the transitoriness rather this is itself actual and is bound up with the work and vanishes with it the negative falls away along with the positive whose negation it is the very notion of substantially and inherently real individuality contains within it this transience of transitoriness verschwinden des verschwindens for that wherein the work disappears or what disappears in the work is the objective reality and this was to give experience as it was called its supremacy over the notion which individuality has about itself objective reality however is a moment which itself has no longer independent truth in this mode of consciousness it consists solely in the unity of this consciousness with action and the real work is only that unity of action and existence of willing and performance on account of the certainty fundamental to its action consciousness takes the actual reality contrasted with that conscious certainty to be something which is only for consciousness the opposition cannot any longer stand before consciousness where this is for itself and independent as against the actual reality for consciousness here is self-consciousness returned into itself and with all opposition gone on the contrary the opposition and the negativity manifested in the case of work thus affect not only the content of the work or again the content of consciousness but actual reality as such and hence affect both the opposition present merely in virtue of that reality and in it and the disappearance of the work in this way consciousness turns from its transient work back upon itself and asserts its own notion and its certainty to be the permanent and abiding fact as against the experience of the fortuitousness of action in point of fact it comes to know its essential principle or notion in which actuality is only a moment something for consciousness not something in and for itself it finds that reality to be a passing moment of significance therefore merely as being in general whose universality is one and the same as action this unity this identity is the true work it is the real fact the actual fact itself die sache selbst which absolutely asserts itself and is experienced as the lasting element independent of that fact which is the accident of individual action as such the accident of circumstances means an actuality the real fact itself stands opposed to these moments only so far as they claim to have a value in isolation but is essentially their unity because identifying fusing actuality with individuality it is too an action and qua doing pure action in general and thereby just as much action of this particular individual and this action because still appertaining to the individual in opposition to actuality has the sense of a purpose similarly it is the transition from the specific character to the opposite 
and finally it is a reality which is present objectively for consciousness the actual fact thus expresses the essential spiritual substance in which all these moments as independently valid are cancelled and transcended and so hold good only as universal and in which the certainty consciousness has regarding itself is a fact a real object before consciousness an object born of self-consciousness as its own without ceasing to be a free independent object in the proper sense the thing found at the stage of sense certainty and perception now gets its significance through self-consciousness and through it alone on this rests the distinction between a thing ding, and the fact Sache. a process is gone through here corresponding to what we find in the case of sense experience and perception self-consciousness then has attained its true conception of itself when the stage of real fact is reached fact is the interpenetration of individuality and objectivity in it self-consciousness has arrived at a consciousness of its own substance at the same time as we find self-consciousness here it is a consciousness which has just arisen and hence is immediate and this is the specific way in which you find spirit at the present stage it has not yet reached its truly real substance the fact itself takes in this immediate consciousness the form of bare and simple essence einfachen wesens which being universal contains all its various moments in itself and belongs to them but again is also indifferent towards them taken as specific moments and is independent by itself and as this free and independent simple abstract fact passes for the essentially real wesen the various moments of the original determinateness the moments of the fact of this particular individual his purpose means action and actual reality are on the one hand particular moments for this consciousness which it can abandon and give up for the fact itself on the other hand however they all have the fact itself as their essential nature but only in such a way that it being their abstract universal can find itself in each of them and be their predicate the fact itself is not yet subject but those moments stand for subject because they belong to the aspect of particularity while fact itself is only at the stage bare universality fact is the genus which finds all these moments to be species of itself and in that way is independent of them consciousness is called honest when it has on the one hand attained this idealization idealismus which fact expresses and on the other possesses the truth in the fact qua this form of universality consciousness when so characterized takes to do solely with fact and hence occupies itself with its various moments or species and when it does not reach the fact in one of these moments does not find the real fact in one meaning it just on that account lays hold of the fact in another and consequently always really secures that satisfaction which should belong to this mode of consciousness by its very nature seinem begriffe nach however things turn out it achieves and secures the fact itself for the latter being this universal genus of those moments is the predicate of all should it not bring a purpose into reality it may have at least willed the purpose that is may turn purpose qua purpose mere doing which does nothing into the fact itself and can therefore maintain and feel satisfied that at least there has always been something attempted something done since the universal contains within it even the negative or the transitoriness this too the nothingness of work is itself its doing it has stimulated others towards this and still finds satisfaction in the disappearance of its reality just as bad boys enjoy personal pleasure in getting their ears boxed because they are the cause of its being done or again suppose it has not so much as tried to carry out the fact itself and done nothing at all then it has not even cared the fact itself is for it just the unity of its decision with reality it asserts that the reality was nothing else than its own wish in the matter sein mögen finally suppose something of interest has come its way entirely without its help then for it this reality is the fact itself just by the interest which it finds in the fact although the reality was not brought about by its doing if it is a piece of luck which has befallen the individual personally he reckons it his own act and his own desert if it is on the other hand a mere event which does not concern him further he makes it likewise his own and an interest where he has done nothing is held as a party interest which he has taken up and defended or maintained for or against the honesty or honourableness of this mode of consciousness as well as the satisfaction which it meets with at every point 
really consists as the above makes clear in this that it does not bring together its ideas regarding the fact itself fact itself is just as much its own affair seine sache as no work at all or mere action and bare purpose or again a reality involving no action at all it makes one meaning after another the subject of this predicate and forgets one after the other by its having merely willed or again in not having wanted fact itself has now the meaning of empty purpose and of the merely ideal thought unity of willing and performance the consolation for the annihilation of the purpose which was at all events willed or at all events simply done as well as the satisfaction of having given others something to do makes the simple doing or the entirely bad work the essential reality for that must be called a bad work which is no work at all finally in the case of finding through good luck the reality at hand this existence without any act becomes the fact itself the true meaning of this honesty however lies in not being so honest as it seems for it cannot be so unintelligent as to let these various moments fall apart in that way it must have an immediate consciousness regarding their opposition because they are absolutely related to one another bare action is essentially action of this individual and this action is likewise essentially an actuality or a fact conversely actuality essentially is only as its own action and as action in general as well and just as his own action is action in general so it is only reality in general well then he thinks he has only to do with the fact itself as abstract reality there is also present this idea that he has to do with it as his own doing but precisely so far as it is only a matter of being busy about doing something he is not really in earnest on the point but rather is dealing with a fact and with fact as his own since finally he seems to will merely his own fact and his own action it is again a matter of dealing with fact in general or actuality substantial and abiding an und für sich bleibende just as fact and its moments appear at this stage as content they are likewise necessary also forms in consciousness they come forward as content merely to pass away again each making room for the other they have therefore to be present in a determinate result as cancelled and sublated forms so taken however they are aspects of consciousness fact itself is present as the inherent nature or its reflection into self the ousting of the moments by each other there finds expression however in their being established in consciousness not per se but only for another consciousness one of the moments of the content is exposed by it to the light and presented as an object for others consciousness however is at the same time reflected therefrom back upon itself and the opposite is thus equally present within it is retained for itself as its own there is too not one of them which could be merely and solely put outside and another merely retained within rather consciousness operates alternately with them for it has to make one as well as another essential for itself and for others the whole is the moving process of permeating individuality with the universal in that this consciousness finds this whole however to be merely the simple ultimate nature wesen and thus the abstraction of fact itself the moments of this whole appear as distinct outside the fact and outside one another as a single whole it is only exhaustively exhibited by the process of alternately exposing its elements to view and keeping them within itself since in this alternation consciousness has in its process of reflection one moment for itself and keeps it as essential while another is merely externally implied or is for others there thus enters a play of individualities with one another where they both deceive and find deceived themselves and one another reciprocally an individuality then sets to work to carry out something by so doing it seems to have made something into an actual fact it acts by so doing it comes out before others and thinks it is occupied with reality others therefore take its action to be an interest in the fact as such and take the end of the act to be the carrying out of the fact per se regardless of whether this is done by the former individuality or by them when on this account they point out that this fact has already brought about by themselves or if not offer and actually furnish their assistance then they see that consciousness has rather left the position where they think it to be it is its own action and effort which arouses its interest in the fact and when they come to know that this was the fact itself they feel themselves deceived 
in reality however their haste to render assistance was itself nothing else than their desire to see and manifest their own action and not the fact itself that is they wanted to receive the other individual just in the way they complain of having been deceived since there has now been brought to light that its own action and effort the play of its powers is taken for the fact itself consciousness seems to be occupied in its own way on its own account and not of that of others and only troubles about action qua its own action and not about action qua an action of others and hence seems to let others in their turn keep to their own fact but they go wrong again that consciousness has already left the point where they thought it was it does not take the matter in hand to be fact in the sense of this own particular fact but fact qua fact qua something universal which is for all hence it interferes in the action and work of others and if consciousness can no longer take their work out of their hands it is at least interested in the matter and shows this by its concern to pass judgment when it stamps the result with the mark of its approval and praise this is meant to imply that in the case of work it does not merely praise the work itself but at the same time its own generosity and moderation in not having destroyed the work as work nor spoiled it by finding fault since it shows an interest in the work it enjoys its own self therein and in the same way the work which it found fault with is welcomed for just this enjoyment of its own action which is thereby procured those however who regard themselves as or profess to be deceived by this interference with others want it really themselves to deceive in the same way they give out their efforts and doings as something only for themselves in which they merely have themselves and their own nature in view but since they do something and thus express their nature bring themselves to the light of day they directly contradict by their deed the pretext of wanting to exclude the daylight that is to exclude the publicity of universal consciousness and participation by every one actualization is on the contrary an exposing of what is one's own in a universal element where it comes to be and has to be fact for every one consciousness then is as much deception of itself as of others if it is pretended that the bare fact is its sole concern a consciousness that lays open a fact soon learns that others want to hurry to the spot and make themselves busy there like flies to new milk and they in their turn find out in its case that it is not dealing with fact qua object but with its own fact on the other hand if only action itself the use of powers and capacities or the expression of a given individuality is to be the essential thing they reciprocally learn that all are affected and consider themselves invited to deal with the matter and that instead of a mere abstract action or a particular peculiar action something has been elicited and exposed which was likewise for others or is a fact itself in both cases the same thing happens and only appears to be different by contrast with that which was accepted and assumed to hold on the matter consciousness finds both sides to be equally essential moments and thereby learns what the nature of the fact itself is that is that it is neither merely fact which is opposed to action in general and to the particular action nor action which is opposed to permanence and which might be the genus independent of these moments as its species but rather that fact itself is an essential reality whose existence means the action of the particular individual and of all individuals and whose action is immediately for others or is a fact and is only fact in the sense of an action of each and all the essential reality which is the essence of all beings reason which is spiritual essence consciousness learns that no one of these moments is subject but rather gets dissolved in the universal fact itself the moments of individuality which were taken as subject one after another by this unreflective incoherent stage of consciousness coalesce and concentrate into simple individuality which while at this a particular is likewise directly universal fact itself thereby ceases to stand in the relation of a predicate loses the characteristic of lifeless abstract universality it is substance permeated by individuality subject wherein individuality is just as much individual or this particular individuality as all individuals and the universal which has an existence only as being this action of each and all gets an actual reality in that this particular consciousness knows it to be its own individual reality and the reality of all pure fact itself is what was characterized above as the category being which is the ego or ego which is being but in the sense of thought which is still distinguished from actual self-consciousness here however the moments of actual self-consciousness 
being for self and being for another so far as we call them its content purpose action and reality and also in so far as we call them its form are made identical with the bare and simple category itself and the category is thereby at the same time the entire content end of section twenty four section twenty five of the phenomenology of mind volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by phone the phenomenology of mind volume one by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey chapter five c subsection b reason as lawgiver translator's note the next step in the development of individuality is to bring out the universal conditions of its coexistence with other individualities this it can do because it is complete in itself and is essentially self-conscious reason these conditions are many because of the diversity of its own content and of the relations in which it stands and are yet the conditions of individuality which is one and single hence the plurality never implies a separation the conditions limit each other's operation and their precise operation must be determined these then are the two stages in determining the general conditions or laws of coexistence of individuality one the enunciation of different laws by and for rational individuality two the relation of these laws inter se and to the single principle from which they all proceed both stages owe their existence to the activity of reason reason promulgates laws and criticizes tests the validity of the laws hence the two following sections end of translator's note reason as lawgiver spiritual essential reality is in its bare existence pure consciousness and also a particular self-consciousness the originally determinate nature of the individual has lost its positive significance of being inherently the element and purpose of its activity it is merely a superseded moment while the individual is a self in the sense of a universal self conversely the formal fact itself gets its content and filling in active individuality with the distinctions it draws within itself for these distinctions compose the content of that universal the category is implicit an sich, as the universal of pure consciousness it is also explicit für sich, for the self of consciousness is likewise its moment it is absolute being for that universality is the bare self-identity of being thus the significance of what is object for consciousness lies in its being the truth it is and it holds good in the sense of being and holding good by itself as an independent entity an und für sich selbst it is the absolute fact which no longer suffers from the opposition between what is certain and what is true between universal and particular between purpose and its reality but whose existence is the reality and action of self-consciousness this fact is therefore the ethical substance and consciousness of it is ethical consciousness its object is likewise taken to be the truth for it combines self-consciousness and being in a single unity it stands for what is absolute for self-consciousness cannot and will not again go beyond this object because it is there at home with itself it cannot for the object is all its power and all its being it will not because the object is itself or the will of this particular self it is the real object inherently as object for it contains and involves the distinction which consciousness implies it divides itself into areas or spheres massen, which are the determinate laws of the absolute reality that is the ethical substance these spheres however do not obscure the notion for the moments being bare consciousness and self are kept contained within it a unity which constitutes the inner nature of these spheres and no longer lets these moments in this distinction fall apart from one another these laws or groups massen, of the substance of ethical life are directly recognized and acknowledged we cannot ask for their origin and justification nor is there something else to search for as their warrant for something other than this independent self-subsistent reality an und für sich sein des wesen could only be self-consciousness itself but self-consciousness is nothing else than this reality for itself is the self-existence of this reality which is the truth just because it is as much the self of consciousness as its inherent nature sein ansich or pure consciousness 
since self-consciousness knows itself to be a moment of this substance the moment of self-existence of independence and self-determination it expresses the existence of the law within itself in the form the healthy natural reason knows immediately what is right and good as healthy reason knows the law immediately so the law is valid for it also immediately and it says directly this is right and good this a particular for there are determinate specific laws the this is fact itself with a concrete filling and content what is thus given immediately must likewise be accepted and regarded as immediate as in the case of the immediacy of sense experience so here we have also to consider the nature of the existence to which this immediate certainty in ethical experience gives expression to analyze the constitution of the immediately existing areas massen, of ethical reality examples of some such laws will show what we want to know and since we take them in the form of declarations of the healthy reason knowing them we have not in this connection first to bring to notice the moment which has to be made good in their case when looked at as immediate ethical laws every one ought to speak the truth in this duty as expressed unconditionally the condition will at once be granted that is if he knows the truth the command will therefore now run every one should speak the truth at all times according to his knowledge and conviction about it the healthy reason this very ethical consciousness which knows immediately what is right and good will explain that this condition had all the while been so bound up with that universal maxim that it meant the command to be taken in that sense it thereby admits however in point of fact that in the very expression of the maxim it eo ipso really violated it the healthy reason said each should speak the truth it intended however he must speak the truth according to his knowledge and conviction that is to say it spoke otherwise than it intended and to speak otherwise than one intends means not speaking the truth the improved untruth or inaptitude now takes the form each must speak the truth according to his knowledge and conviction about it on each occasion thereby however what was universally necessary and absolutely valid and this the proposition wanted to express has turned round into what is really a complete contingency for speaking the truth is left to the chance whether i know it and can convince myself of it and there is nothing more in the statement than that truth and falsehood are to be spoken as they come just as any one happens to know intend and understand this contingency in the content has universality merely in the propositional form of the expression but as an ethical maxim the proposition promises a universal and necessary content and thus contradicts itself by the content being contingent finally if the maxim were to be improved by saying that the contingency of the knowledge and the conviction as to the truth should be dropped and that the truth too ought to be known then this would be a command which contradicts straightway what we started from healthy reason was at first assumed to have the immediate capacity of expressing the truth now however we are saying that it ought to know the truth that is that it does not immediately know how to express the truth looking at the content this has dropped out in the demand that we should know the truth for this demand refers to knowing in general we ought to know what is demanded is therefore strictly speaking something independent of every specific content but here the whole point of the statement concerned a definite content a distinction involved in the substance of the ethical life yet this inherent determination of that substance is a content of such a kind as turned out really to be a complete contingency and when we try to get the required universality and necessity by making the law refer to the knowledge instead of to the content then the content really disappears altogether another celebrated command runs love thy neighbour as thyself it is directed to an individual standing in relation to another individual and asserts this law as a relation of a particular individual to a particular individual that is a relation of sentiment or feeling empfindung active love for an inactive love has of course no existence and is therefore doubtless not intended here aims at removing evil from some one and bringing him good to do this we have to distinguish what the evil is what is the appropriate good to meet this evil and what in general his well-being consists in that is we have to love him intelligently unintelligent love will do him harm perhaps more than hatred intelligent veritable wesentlich well-doing is however in its richest and most important form the intelligent universal action of the state 
an action compared with which the action of a particular individual as such is something altogether so trifling that it is hardly worth talking about the action of the state is in this connection of such great weight and strength that if the action of the individual were to oppose it and either sought to be straightway and deliberately fiel sich criminal or out of the love for another wanted to cheat the universal out of the right and claim which it has upon him such action would be useless and would inevitably be annihilated hence all that well-doing which lies in sentiment and feeling can mean is something wholly and solely particular it amounts to merely a temporary relief which is as contingent as it is momentary chance determines not merely its occasion but also whether it is a work at all whether it is not at once dissipated again and whether it does not itself really turn to evil thus this sort of action for the good of others which is given out as necessary is so constituted that it may just as likely not exist as exist is such that if the occasion by chance arises it may possibly turn out a work may possibly be good but just as likely may not this law therefore has as little of a universal content as the first above considered and fails to express anything substantial something objectively real per se an und für sich which it should do if it is to be an absolute ethical law in other words such laws never get further than they ought to be they have no actual reality they are not laws but merely commands it is however in point of fact clear from the very nature of the case that we must renounce all claim to an absolute universal content for every specific determination which the bare and simple substance and its very nature consists in being simple might get is inadequate to its nature the command itself in its simple absoluteness expresses immediate ethical existence the distinction appearing in it is a specific determinate element and thus a content standing under the absolute universality of this simple existence since then an absolute content must thus be renounced formal universality is the only kind that is possible and suitable and this means merely that it is not to contradict itself for universality devoid of content is formal and an absolute content amounts to a distinction which is no distinction that is means absence of content in default of all content there is thus nothing left with which to make a law but the bare form of universality in fact the mere tautology of consciousness a tautology which stands over against the content and consists in a knowledge not of the content actually existing the content proper but of its ultimate essence only a knowledge of its self-consistency the ethical being is consequently not itself ipso facto a content but only a standard for deciding whether a content is capable of being a law or not when the content does not contradict itself reason as lawgiver is reduced to being reason as criterion instead of laying down laws reason now only tests what is laid down End of section twenty five